Hi there, I'm Admiral, and in this video, I'll be attempting to beat Pokemon Heart Gold with just one Tyranitar. If you saw my last video, in which I beat Fire Red with only three Dragonite, you'll know that this challenge probably won't be too difficult compared to the usual Pokemon challenges on YouTube. However, I do expect this to be more difficult than that last challenge for a couple of reasons. The first is that I've never actually played through Johto. I've never touched Gen 2, and I never played the Gen 4 remakes of Gen 2, so Johto was entirely unknown to me. I don't know this game, its story route, or its major bosses outside of a handful of gym leaders and Elite Four members, and that's just from watching other people play the game. This is going to be a mostly blind playthrough. The second reason that this challenge will be harder than the Dragonite run is just Tyranitar as a Pokemon. I actually think it's one of the weakest pseudo-legendary Pokemon, mainly due to its typing. Tyranitar is a rock and dark type Pokemon. The first and most obvious problem with that is our four times weakness to fighting type moves. Dragonite had a similar weakness to Ice, but fighting is one of the most common offensive typings in the game, if not the single most common. Whereas we only ran into a handful of Pokemon with Ice moves in the last run, we'll be dealing with a ton of fighting moves here, including Bruno, one of the characters that return in this game from Kanto. And if that quad weakness wasn't bad enough, we're weak to five other types. If this were Gen 6, that number would only go up because of the Fairy type. Overall, we're going to have to play very well to avoid getting clapped during every major fight. Our stat distribution doesn't do us any favors either. We have monstrous physical stats, but our special defense isn't great, especially considering that we're weak to water and grass, two types that are mostly special. Even worse is our speed, the lowest stat we have. I can see us getting outsped and smacked with one of the incredible fighting moves that this generation introduced slash made common, like close combat or superpower. On top of all of that, we're only using one Pokemon this time. Our three saving graces in this run are going to be the physical special split, our move pool, and our ability sandstream. The physical special split is the entire reason that I want to do this run in Gen 4 and not in the original Gen 2 games. With Tyranitar's clear need to be built as a defensive physical sweeper, I can't afford to not have a physical moveset, especially not one that doesn't take full advantage of our dual typing. The dark type was special until Gen 4, including moves like Bite and Crunch, so we would have been out of luck for half of our stab capability. That's especially devastating when you consider how inaccurate pretty much every rock move is. Off the top of my head, Ancient Power is the only 100% accurate rock move, and that's not going to be great for us since it's a special move now. However, the physical special split lets us take full advantage of a broader range of moves, so we'll be better off. In addition, our move pool is excellent, especially from level up. At level 14, we get Rock Slide, a strong move that can cause flinching. Later on, we get Earthquake, Crunch, and Stone Edge, all of which I plan to have in our final setup. Our learn set from TMs is expansive too. I'm not sure what our last move will be, but I'm leaning towards Aerial Ace at the moment to give us an answer to grass and fighting types. Finally, Sandstream is an incredible ability that sets up a Sandstorm whenever Tyranitar comes out. Starting in Gen 4, Sandstorms boost the special defense of every Rock-type Pokemon by 50%, so even if, for example, we get outsped by Surf, the Sandstorm should help us survive anyway. Like last time, I'll be writing the script as I'm playing through the game, so you'll get mostly unfiltered commentary on the run and my opinions regarding Johto and Tyranitar. With that long intro out of the way though, I'm ready to get into the game. Getting into the run itself, I used the Universal Pokemon Randomizer to swap Chikorita out with Tyranitar. My initial thinking was just changing out a green Pokemon with a slightly better green Pokemon, but this will give my rival Typhlosion, which is certainly our best matchup. I name it Kratos, because I've had God of War on the brain for like two weeks, and get tasked with going to a new town. Before I set out though, I check our nature. We have a bold nature, so lower attack and higher defense. Honestly, I'm not really happy with this, but all I can do is hope it doesn't hurt us down the line. I get ready to leave town, but nobody gave me a map, so after getting my Poke gear, I just go west and hope for the best. Once I get to Mr. Pokemon's house, I receive an egg and meet Professor Oak, who gives me a Pokedex. I head outside to go back to Professor Elm, but he calls first to tell me about some crisis happening at the lab. On my way through Cherry Grove, I'm accosted by a guy with a bad haircut, who promptly gets whooped by Kratos before saying he's going to be the greatest trainer in history. That's a pretty hefty dose of copium there if you ask me, but I just hit the legs to get this egg back to Elm. I get back to the lab and the cops accuse me of being a thief, but Lyra clears that up and I relay my rival's name of Stinko before Elm suggests I take the gym challenge. He name drops Violet City, so I guess that's my first stop. On the way, I make sure to battle every trainer and wild Pokemon I can so I can hit level 14. I'm pretty sure that the first two gyms are flying and bug themed, so having Rock Slide will be invaluable. 
I also learned that you can avoid giving people your contact information in this game, which is incredible because I'm really bad at talking to new people. I make it to Violet City at level 9, and confirm that the first gym is for flying types. I head to Bellsprout Tower to tack on some more levels. Even though we're weak to grass, Bellsprout is a weak enough Pokemon that I don't expect too much trouble here. I reach the top, where I encounter Stinko having a villain monologue about how abusing Pokemon is okay, actually, before he leaves and I get flashed by an old man. I'm at level 12 now, but I'm not content. I decide to fight the trainers in the gym too, but they leave me just shy of level 13, so I head out to grind. It may seem like I'm doing too much for the first gym, but my only attacking move is Bite. Beyond the advantage against flying types, traveling is going to suck if I don't get another move as soon as I can. Once I have Rock Slide, I head straight to the gym for the fight against Faulkner. Even though he's named after one of my favorite authors, I have Kratos brutally beat both the boys' birds, bagging the badge. I receive summons from Professor Elm to head next door to the Pokemart, where I receive an egg, which I take with me as I head to Azalea Town, home of the next gym. During my journey south, I catch a Rattata and a Bellsprout for Rock Smash and Flash respectively, as I expect to need them to get to Azalea. I also pick up a Shell Bell, which I have Kratos hold. I arrive at Azalea Town, where I learn that Team Rocket is back and apparently illegally hunting and butchering Slowpoke for their meat. I rain vengeance down upon them for their crimes, opening up the next gym. I head into the Bug Gym, but I'm not particularly concerned here. Kratos has earned quite a few levels between traveling and beating up Team Rocket, so I should have no problem sweeping with Rock Slide, even with a few misses. Bugsy leads with Scyther, who outspeeds Kratos and hits a nasty U-turn. Scyther switches out for Metapod, who gets squashed by a Rock Slide in his place. Scyther comes back out, and I expect another U-turn pivot since that will allow Scyther to hit a third, which will absolutely take Kratos down, but instead he just uses Focus Energy. That lets Kratos connect with another Rock Slide, taking Scyther out and bringing Bugsy to his last Pokemon, a Kakuna. To nobody's great surprise though, Kratos sends it to join the rest of Bugsy's team, getting us a fairly easy win. I'm not entirely sure where to go next, but I'm getting strong hints that it's the Ilex Forest, so I head west after picking up the HM boys from the box. Unfortunately, I'm once again assaulted by Stinko. He leads Ghastly, but Kratos knows Bite, so you can probably guess how that goes for him. Next out is a Zubat. We miss Rock Slide, which is frustrating, but even more frustrating is losing two turns to self-inflicted damage after we get confused by Supersonic. Once Zubat finally faints, we face off against his last Pokemon, Quilava. I hate to do this, since it's actually my favorite line of the Johto starters, but I take it down after missing my first Rock Slide, winning the fight. Stinko has another angsty monologue about weakness, and then heads deeper into the forest. His Pokemon don't know Cut, but his sheer edge should have no problem removing the trees in there. While I navigate the forest, the egg hatches to reveal a Togepi. I name it Atreus, since it's technically Kratos' kid, and keep on moving. I make it to Goldenrod, and immediately get lost. I stop at the radio tower, assuming it's important, and take the quiz. Apparently, that gets the gym leader back to her gym, so go me! I have to actually go and find the gym, but once I do, I should be okay. Kratos is still pretty high level, so it shouldn't be too hard. I make my way to the gym battle against Whitney. I've heard legends of her Miltank, so I'm expecting this one to be tough, but first I have to deal with her Clefairy. Bite leaves it with a sliver of health, and it retaliates with a soft double slap. Sandstorm damage finishes it off, and her Miltank comes out. It outspeeds and hits Kratos with a stomp, getting a flinch. Then it flinches Kratos with another stomp. A third stomp doesn't get a flinch, so Kratos hits back with a strong bite. And then Kratos gets flinched again! Kratos manages to dodge another flinch, though, so a second bite just finishes the battle. This one wasn't as hard as I'd been led to believe. With more favorable RNG, it probably would have been even easier. I head due north to Ecritique next, where I'll face off against Morty, the ghost-type gym leader. Unfortunately for him, Kratos is half dark-type with stab bite. I'll be giving a gentle kiss on the forehead to whoever guesses what happens in this one correctly first. While you all get your guesses ready, I'll be heading to the Burn Tower to actually get Morty into the gym. While there, I notice Stinko in the corner, so we have to talk about that first. Stinko leads Ghastly, but he just gets reminded of our last battle as it goes down in one bite. Next out is Magnemite, who gets left deep in the red from a Rock Slide. Rock Slide makes it flinch, so on the next turn, Kratos just finishes it off with a bite. Zubat is next, but we connect this time to one shot with Rock Slide. Finally, Quilava comes out, and outspeeds to hit Kratos with a smokescreen. Kratos is sick of Stinko's constant angst, though, and breaks through the accuracy drop to one-shot with Rockslide, giving us an easy victory. 
Stinko huffs more copium as he tries to convince himself that he's not a bad trainer, and we move on. Next up is Morty. If you guessed Kratos one-shot sweeps his whole team with bite, you're almost right. His lead Ghastly indeed goes down to one bite, but he sends Gengar out next. Gengar outspeeds and puts Kratos to sleep off of Hypnosis, and then starts attacking with Shadow Ball. After three turns, Kratos wakes up and nails Gengar with a critical bite. Next out is Haunter, who also outspeeds and hits Kratos with Nightshade. Kratos retaliates with Bite for the one-shot, and Morty's second Haunter comes out. Kratos outspeeds, though, and another critical Bite finishes the battle. Getting outsped by everyone is starting to get really annoying, but we pull through, so I'm not going to complain too much. Now I just have to figure out where we're supposed to go next. As we've just unlocked the ability to surf outside of battle, I use my massive brain to deduce that our next stops are going to be Olivine and Sienwood, since they're on the water, so I grab the HM boys and head west. I make it to Olivine and immediately run into Stinko. He nearly gives himself a better haircut with all of his edge, but moves on without making me fight him. To his credit, he does direct me to the lighthouse, so I make that my next destination. Hey there gang, so I'm uh, editing the video right now, and I've just learned that about a day's worth of footage got corrupted. So for the next few minutes, you're going to be seeing an artistic rendition of all the things that I did because I don't have footage to show you anymore. I hope you enjoy it. Kratos and I tear our way through the lighthouse and meet Jasmine, who sends me to Sianwood across the sea to grab medicine for Ampharos, but there's a small problem. I don't have Surf. Heck, I don't even have a fishing rod yet to catch a Pokemon that can learn Surf. So it looks like I'm asking around Olivine for Surf, and if that doesn't work, I'm heading back to Ecrotique to see if I can find it there. Luckily, I get the good rod from a fisherman in Olivine, so that's half of the search finished. I make it back to Ecrotique, and that's when I remember that actually, yes, I do have Surf, which I got from an old man in the dance hall when I visited and beat the Team Rocket grunt before I did the Burn Tower. I double check to make sure that I have it before taking the Walk of Shame back to Olivine, where I fish up a Krabby and teach it Surf. I head to Sandwood, where I snag the medicine for Ampharos. I also start asking around to make sure I don't miss any items or HMs, where I learned that Stinko stole a guy's Pokemon. He gives me the only one he has left, and it's a Shockle. This isn't actually important to the run, I just really like Shockle. Also, Suicune is just... here? It's chillin' though, so I decide to leave it alone and head to the gym. To my horror, this gym is a fighting-type gym. I knew going into this run that some Johto Elite 4 members are returning characters from Kanto, including the fighting specialist Bruno, so I didn't think they'd double up on fighting-type bosses. Even worse, fighting Pokemon resist both of Kratos' stab types, and Thrash will leave me confused if he has more than three Pokemon, or they don't all go down in one hit. I'll see how things look after dealing with the gym trainers, but I'm not optimistic. I may have to look up the location of Aerial Ace's TM for this one. After fighting the gym trainers, I feel even worse. I didn't get any levels, and a random Hitmonchan nearly took us to half health with a single Mach Punch. That move only has 40 base power. Looking at our TMs, though, I think I see an out. We have Dig, which we'll need for Olivine's Steel Gym anyway. If I'm able to soften up a Pokemon with Dig, and then sweep with Thrash, we might be okay. With the Shell Bell healing Kratos, this might not be a total stomp. If I'm wrong, I'll see about picking up Aerial Ace, but it's definitely worth trying first. Our first attempt actually starts off okay. Chuck leads with Primeape, who outspeeds Kratos to set up a double team. Kratos connects with Thrash, bringing it into the yellow. On the next turn, Primeape readies a Focus Punch, but Kratos thankfully hits it with a critical Thrash to take it out before it can hit us. Unfortunately, we've rolled for two attacks instead of three, so Kratos is confused as Polyrath comes out. Even worse, Polyrath just goes for Focus Punch as Kratos damages itself in confusion. We obviously get one shot here, so we lose. I'm at a bit of a loss now. If Thrash is barely doing any damage without critting, there's no way Dig will be enough to soften them up without us getting hit. Even worse, I learned the only places to get Aerial Ace are the Battle Frontier and Mount Mortar. The Battle Frontier is obviously off limits, since it's locked behind the post game. Meanwhile, I can only get the TM from Mount Mortar with Waterfall, a move I can't use outside of battle yet. Aerial Ace is the only move we can learn that helps us deal with fighting types, so my only solution here seems to be grinding. The next move we can learn that deals neutral damage to fighting types is Earthquake at level 47, a move that will really help against the Steel Gym too. Kratos is at level 33, so that's 14 levels to grind in the slow leveling group. I don't see any other options here though, so I'll just head back to Olivine and grind in the grass there, 
since there's nothing to fight against at Sayamwood. The grind here is miserable. My biggest complaint about this game so far is that wild Pokemon are weak everywhere you go. I'm at the 5th gym, but still have to grind against level 17 Pokemon. Chuck's Polyrath was level 31, by the way. It would be better if we were in a normal leveling group, but we aren't. That's actually the whole reason I went with one Pokemon this time instead of three. It's much less tedious to level one pseudo-legendary, so here we are. Plus, I couldn't think of anything funny to do with multiple Tyranitar in terms of names, but we can just pretend that it's only because of the grind. After about 20 minutes of grinding only takes me up one level, I make the executive decision to cheat in Rare Candies. I don't feel good about it, but I have a job and stuff, so I can't really afford to spend hours just trying to get this one grind done. It's really unfortunate, but hopefully we won't have to do it again, and I'd much rather just be honest about it than sit here and pretend I did it for real. With our integrity in shambles, Kratos and I limp our way back to the fighting gym for round two. Honestly, even with our overhauled moves and stats, I'm still not confident that we'll take this easily. Once again, Chuck leads with the Primeape, but we outspeed this time and one-shot it with Earthquake. As Polyrath comes out, I'm starting to think I may have gone overboard with the levels, but Earthquake takes it to what seems to be exactly a quarter of its HP. It retaliates with Surf, and my heart sinks before it barely leaves a dent in Kratos' HP. The Sandstorm did great work there, but Kratos has a surprisingly good special defense, so I really didn't need to worry there. A follow-up Earthquake takes Polyrath down as it just tries to use Focus Punch, and we've won! I can't say it felt earned, but I also don't think we could have done it any differently. It was either just do it now or two days from now. Still, if anyone has suggestions for better ways to approach rare candy use in the future, please let me know in the comments. I head straight back to Olivine to help out the Ampharos and get the gym leader back to her actual job. Jasmine leads with her first Magnemite, and I realize that I never took Kratos to a Pokemon Center after the fighting gym. I wasn't kidding when I said I went straight here. I'm not too worried about our HP, just our Earthquake PP. Magnemite is quad weak to ground though, so one critical Earthquake takes it down. Our next opponent is Steelix, whose ground typing makes him dangerous for Kratos. We hit it with a hard Earthquake before Citrus Berry takes it back to green health. It just hits us with Screech, and on the next turn we leave it in critical condition with another Earthquake. It retaliates with an Earthquake of its own, taking us close to half health. Jasmine heals on the next turn, so we get another Earthquake in for free. A follow-up finally finishes it off, and Jasmine brings out her second Magnemite. Another Earthquake secures us the win, with just one more Earthquake to spare. With that stressful battle out of the way, we're free to grab the HM boys and head east. I head north from Mahogany Town to the Lake of Rage to open up the gym. There's a shiny Gyarados causing a ruckus in the lake, so I bonk him on the noggin with some rocks to calm him down. I meet Lance, the inferior Dragonite trainer, on the shore where he asks me to meet him back in Mahogany Town. I head to the souvenir shop and arrive just in time to see Lance fucking murder a guy with Hyper Beam. Jesus Christ! Lyra calls to tell me about the lighthouse, and I can do nothing to tell her of the horror I've just witnessed. Anyway, the rocket hideout is fairly straightforward. Stinko shows up to complain that Lance kicked his butt and then leaves. I've got no idea why he's even here, but whatever. With that finished, I head to the gym. It's an ice gym, but we've got stab super effective rock slides, so I'm not too worried here. He leads with Seal, who takes neutral damage off a rock slide. It doesn't matter, though, as it just goes down in one hit. Next out is Pillow Swine, who also takes neutral damage from a rock slide. It's left in the red, but a citrus berry pulls it out. It flinches, so I switch to Earthquake on the next turn to make sure I don't risk a miss, taking it down. Last out is Dugong, the only member of his team that's actually weak to rock, so it also gets one shot with Rock Slide for a clean sweep. I find myself recalled to Goldenrod, where Team Rocket has taken over the radio in an attempt to get Giovanni to return. I manage to find a Team Rocket uniform so I can sneak in, but Stinko barges in after me and strips me in front of the grunt guarding the stairs, so that plan fails. I just force my way through with Kratos, and things go fine. In the process of doing the Goldenrod stuff, I'm once again accosted by Stinko, this time in the city's underground. He leads his Golbat, who Kratos just grounds with a rock slide. Next out is Magnemite, but an earthquake from Kratos finishes that discussion before it can really start. Third up is Sneasel, who gets one shot by a super effective rock slide. He tries sending out Quilava next, and Kratos responds with an earthquake for another one shot. Last out is Haunter, who gets cleanly knocked out by a crunch. The constant L's that Lance and I have been dealing out lead Stinko to consider not being just the worst, so we take two dubs for the price of one. Anywho, I finish up the Radio Tower stuff and move on to Blackthorn, home of the final gym. 
Once again, the game doubles up on boss typings, as this gym matches Lance's dragon types. The battle against Claire ends up being incredibly close. She leads Gyarados, who gets one shot by our newly acquired Stone Edge. Next out is Kingdra, who gets taken to about half health off a of crunch. It heals back up with a Citrus Berry before nailing Kratos with a Smokescreen. Our next crunch leaves Kingdra in healing range, and we take a nasty Hydro Bump in return. If not for the Sandstorm, that would have been much worse. Claire heals, and we just hit Kingdra hard a second time with Crunch. We try to finish it, but miss as another Hydro Pump takes us to about a third of our health. Kratos connects on the follow-up, and next out is Dragonair. We smack it with a Crunch that leaves it with a Sliver, and it paralyzes Kratos with a Thunder Wave. The Sandstorm damage takes it out, and Claire sends out her last Pokemon, another Dragonair. It starts chipping away with Dragon Pulse, but thankfully the Sandstorm helps us avoid taking too much damage from the special move. Between Paralysis and Missing, we end up with just 26 HP left before we can finally finish the battle. Claire, however, is a sore loser and won't acknowledge our win unless we do some dragon thing, so I head out to do that. Once I finish, Professor Elm calls me to tell me he has something cool for me to pick up, so I grab our HM boys and Atreus and head to the lab so I can finally show Elm the Pokemon that hatched from the egg he gave me at the start of the game. He gives me the Master Ball and tells me that the Kimono Girls and Ecritique want to see me, so that's my next stop. I clear their gauntlet with little issue, and ho -Oh arrives at the Bell Tower. Even though I don't intend to use it, I want to catch ho -Oh anyway. To be honest, none of my HM Pokemon can learn Waterfall, and I don't really want to fish up another one if I don't have to, so I want to check if it can learn Waterfall for me. Despite its banger battle theme, it can't learn Waterfall, so I have to fish up a new HM Pokemon. Not only am I assuming I'll need to know Waterfall to get to the Pokemon League, but I really need the TM for Aerial Ace before I fight Bruno. After I have that, I go to the game corner and enter the hell that is Voltorb Flip. I want the Wide Lens, a held item that increases the accuracy of moves. Since Stone Edge only has 80 accuracy, I want to make sure that I can connect with it as often as possible. And now I just have to figure out how to get to the Pokemon League. In fact, the only mention of the League I've noticed so far talks about the Indigo Plateau, but I just assumed that was specific to Kanto. I decide to head to Kanto anyway to see what happens. I look at my map, and sure enough, the Indigo Plateau is marked as the seat of the Elite Four, so I have my final stop. I make my way through Victory Road so I can finally finish the run, but first I have to deal with Stinko one last time. He leads his Sneasel into Kratos and the HM Boys, but one Stone Edge handles it. Next out is Magneton, and Kratos one-shots it with Earthquake. Stinko sends out Haunter. Crunch is more than enough to take care of it, so Typhlosion is next. Earthquake takes it down, so Golbat is our fifth victim. Kratos one-shots it with Stone Edge, and last out is Kadabra. One last crunch completes the sweep, and Stinko finally realizes that I'm better, and he leaves. Now, all that's left is the Elite Four and the Champion. Here are our stats before the Elite Four. Honestly, I'm pretty pleased with how things have turned out. We have great attack, with defensive stats and HP that should let us survive anything we can't outspeed, but even our 105 speed stat is nothing to sneeze at. I'm feeling really good. With our type coverage, this might be a breeze. First up is Will, and I have to admit, when he introduced himself as a trainer of Psychic-type Pokemon, I laughed. Obviously, this is a total wash. All of his Pokemon go down to a single crunch from Kratos. It's not even close. I'm sorry for not going into a ton of detail on this one, but also, come on. I'm only even mentioning this fight because he's in the Elite Four. We're moving on. The second Elite Four member is Koga, one of Kanto's returning characters. He leads with Ariados, and Kratos takes it out with a single Aerial Ace before Connect. Koga sends Foratress out next, and he gives me a bit of trouble. It protects on the first turn, wasting an Earthquake. Kratos connects with Earthquake on the next turn, as Foratress fails to protect a second time. I expect a third protect and select Aerial Ace, but Koga instead opts for Swift. He heals on the next turn, but I'm expecting this and go for Aerial Ace for some more damage. Foratress protects on the next turn, so I fail to hit another Aerial Ace, and then it gets a double protect off, wasting more of my PP. Eventually, though, another Aerial Ace leaves it in range for Earthquake to finish it off. Next out is Muck, but Earthquake cleanly one-shots it. Koga sends out Crobat, who opens with a double team as Stone Edge misses. Crobat uses double team again, but Stone Edge connects this time to take it down. Koga's last Pokemon is Venomoth, but the big bug goes down to a single Aerial Ace, finishing the battle. Next is Bruno, the terrifying fighting type trainer. He leads Hitmontop, and Kratos hits it with a devastating Aerial Ace as it goes for Dig. It's deep in the red, so I use Crunch to avoid wasting valuable Aerial Ace PP while it's underground. It emerges and hits Kratos for a good chunk of damage, but goes down to Sandstorm Chip. Onyx comes out next, and we trade nasty Earthquakes. Bruno heals as Kratos hits a hard Crunch for some chip damage, before finishing it off on the next turn with Earthquake. 
Next is Hitmonlee, but he thankfully goes down to a single aerial ace, so it's out to Hitmonchan next. I expect it to know Mach Punch, but instead it hits an incredibly soft bullet punch before aerial ace takes it down. Last out is Machow. Kratos outspeeds and hits a massive aerial ace, but after a Citrus Berry heals it, Machow retaliates with a cross chop that finishes Kratos off. It wasn't even a crit, which makes it feel that much worse. I'll give it another go and see what happens. Attempt 2 is somehow even worse. Hitmontop goes for counter this time, which brings Kratos all the way to 13 HP. We're able to take it out and then one-shot Onyx with Earthquake. I have no idea why it one-shot this time since it wasn't a crit, but we take those. Hitmonlee is a one-shot again with Aerial Ace, but then Bullet Punch just finishes us. The fifth attempt is the one where I finally pull out the win. I decide to open with Stone Edge, hoping for a crit to one-shot or for it to do really little damage. Up until now, Hitmontop has only countered, so I almost cheered when it went for Dig this time. Right before this attempt, I remember that I have a move that can hit opponents while they're underground, so Earthquake finishes it and Onyx right after. Aerial Ace once again one-shots Hitmonlee, and Hitmonchan hits a bullet punch before going down to Aerial Ace. Matchup is out last, and tanks and Aerial Ace as always. This time, though, we're healthy. He hits a non-critical cross chop that takes Kratos from 180 HP down to just 5, but that's all we need. Kratos outspeeds and finishes the fight with one last Aerial Ace. I am so happy to be past that. Aerial Ace really is the only move we can learn that super effective fighting type Pokemon, so there was no other strategy there except for hoping that I could crit. Fortunately though, we can move on. The last member of the Elite Four is Karen, a Dark type trainer. She opens with Umbreon, who takes an Earthquake very well. It sets up a double team, so I have Kratos followed up with Aerial Ace, but it does surprisingly little damage. Umbreon uses Fant Attack as Kratos uses Aerial Ace again, leaving it in a healing range. It eventually goes down, but not before hitting Kratos with a Confuse Ray. Next out is Karen's Vile Plume, and it immediately paralyzes Kratos with Stun Spore as it takes an Aerial Ace decently well. Kratos no longer has a speed advantage, so Vile Plume is able to get off a critical Petal Dance as Kratos just loses a turn to Confusion. A follow-up Petal Dance leaves Kratos in shambles, but on the next turn we finish it off. Karen sends out Gengar next, and I see my light flash before my eyes as it goes for Focus Blast, but thankfully it misses and goes down to Crunch. It may be a special move, but Sandstorm was not saving us from that. Houndoom comes out and sets up a nasty plot, but thankfully we take it down with a single Earthquake. Last out is Karen's Murkrow, and it hits a critical feint attack to do about 20 damage. Kratos retaliates with a critical stone edge, and we've limped our way to victory. Finally, the champion. Lance opens with Gyarados, so our attack is down for the whole battle because of Intimidate. Luckily, Stone Edge one-shots it anyway, and Lance sends out his first Dragonite. One Stone Edge takes it down, and his second Dragonite comes out. Stone Edge leaves it with barely any HP, and it retaliates with Thunder Wave, so we no longer have a speed advantage. Thankfully, Sandstorm damage finishes it off, and Lance has clearly taken inspiration from our last run, as he sends out his third Dragonite. It outspeeds with Dragon Rush, causing Kratos to flinch. Another Dragon Rush takes us to about half health, but Kratos connects with Stone Edge for the knockout. He sends out Charizard and hits us hard with Dragon Claw, but we retaliate with a quad effective Stone Edge. Last is Aerodactyl, but we're out of Stone Edge PP. I go for Crunch instead after it misses a Rock Slide, taking it to just below half health. It hits a follow up Rock Slide, but Kratos doesn't flinch or get fully paralyzed, so one more Crunch finishes it. With that, we enter the Hall of Fame and finish the run, but it's not quite over. You see, Kratos and I aren't satisfied decimating only one region. After all, there's the entirety of Kanto to consider, and one last challenge after that. Kratos and I cut a bloody path through Kanto and arrive in Viridian for the final gym battle, a match against Giovanni's replacement, Blue. The first attempt goes pretty well. He opens with Executor, and I send out Kratos, now at level 69, a fact I bring up for no particular reason, who takes it down in one crunch. Next out is Rhydon, who survives an Earthquake and retaliates with a Stone Edge. Another Earthquake finishes it, so Blue sends out Gyarados next. We lose attack to Intimidate, but take it out with Stone Edge anyway. Matchup comes out, and takes an Aerial Ace for about half of its health. Its follow-up Dynamic Punch is more than enough to easily take down Kratos. I'll just try again and hope for a better run at it. I think I can take care of everyone else easily, it's just matchup that I can't handle. I have leftovers, so I might switch to those if I keep losing. After too many attempts to count, I eventually realize that this just isn't happening. It's crazy to see how hard we get walled by any fighting type Pokemon we encounter. This is why I think Tyranitar is one of the weakest pseudo-legendaries. It's just so hard to use a Pokemon with so many weaknesses. 
I think it would have been much better as a grounded dark type instead, but I was only 8 months old when the original Gen 2 games came out in Japan, so I didn't get to provide any input. At one point, I even resort to learning Hyper Beam, but that still only does about 3 quarters of Matchamp's health. I'll go ahead and get to level 75 before the next go, and hopefully that will get us out of here. The first level 75 attempt goes mostly the same as every other attempt. Executor is down in one crunch, and Rhydon is taken to the red off of Earthquake and takes out about a third of our health with an Earthquake of its own. Blue heals on the next turn, and Kratos lands a critical Earthquake to take it down. I would have preferred that crit before we lost so much HP, but oh well. Gyarados is a one-shot with Stone Edge, and then Matchup comes out. We hit a hard Aerial Ace, but Dynamic Punch takes us down anyway. It was a crit, but honestly I don't think it mattered. I'll try a few more times before I level Kratos up some more. It becomes very clear very quickly that even at level 75, we just get smacked. Kratos needs to either crit an Aerial Ace to one-shot Matchamp or survive a Dynamic Punch, but neither happens. I'll take us up to level 80 and see if we can get a better result, because this is torture. Our first few attempts at level 80 go the same, with Matchamp taking us down every time, until this one where I actually managed to crit Matchamp for a one-shot. Rhydon hit a nasty crit with Earthquake though, so we're still in very real danger. Blue's next Pokemon is Arcanine, so I'm at minus 2 attack from his and Gyarados' Intimidates. I use Stone Edge instead of Earthquake, hoping that Stab will let us kill anyway, and it does in fact one-shot. Last out is his Pidgeot, who I actually expect to outspeed us, but we go first and connect with Stone Edge for a hard-earned gym badge. After escaping the hell that is the Viridian Gym, I go straight for Red. Kratos and the HM boys, but mostly Kratos, are ready to face off against his team of elite Pokemon. I actually don't think we're ready for this fight because of the level advantage his team holds over Kratos, but I give it a try anyway. Pikachu is out first and outspeeds with a nasty Iron Tail that takes Kratos to half before an Earthquake one-shots it. Blastoise comes out next for Red and also outspeeds to miss a Focus Blast. Kratos does a healthy bit of damage with Crunch, but goes down on the next turn. Like I said, not ready. Kratos will need to be at least level 85 for this, maybe even higher. After a handful of attempts, I get this run where Pikachu and Blastoise miss Iron Tail and two Focus Blasts, so I get to Lapras with no damage. Lapras barely survives a Stone Edge. Red heals, so our follow-up Crunch does great damage to ensure that our next Stone Edge kills. Unfortunately, we miss, so I'm in a bit of a bad spot. I need to keep a Stone Edge for Charizard, so I can't afford to use it here. I switch to Earthquake as it just keeps smacking me with Brian. By the time it goes down, Kratos is close to red health. Venusaur comes out, takes just about half of its health and damage to Aerial Ace, and finishes Kratos with a Giga Drain. I think I need a few more levels and similar luck on Iron Tail and Focus Blast, and we can absolutely do this. I've also picked up a PP Max, so I go ahead and use it on Stone Edge to prevent a similar catastrophe. Honestly, I don't think I'm winning unless I can get to Lapras at full health. Otherwise, Venusaur will do too much damage with Giga Drain for me to get to Charizard and live, since it's definitely going to be faster than Kratos. After way too many attempts, I'm ready to call it and add more levels when I get this insane battle. Pikachu nails Kratos with an Iron Tail, so I already think this attempt is chalked. Blastoise a second, and misses both of its Focus Blasts. On the first turn, I mess up and hit Earthquake instead of Stone Edge, but I do the correct move next time and take it down. Lapras comes out third, but thankfully goes down to one Stone Edge. Next out is Venusaur. In a moment of desperation, I actually did damage calcs because this was so grueling, and it turns out that Stone Edge is my best move for pretty much all of these matchups. I start with that, and then follow it up with an Aerial Ace as Venusaur just misses Sleep Powder. Snorlax is next, and I hit Crunch hoping for a defense drop as Snorlax goes for Blizzard. I hit it with another Crunch, and it lives with just a sliver of health. It hits another Blizzard, and my heart sinks to the depths of the earth. I can only helplessly watch as it freezes poor, abused Kratos. Last out is Charizard, who's too smart to use a Fire-type move to thaw Kratos out. I can only keep trying Stone Edge, fighting desperately to win. After two Dragon Pulses leave Kratos with just 15 HP, I'm sure it's over. But then, the greatest Tyranitar in history thaws out and one-shots Charizard with Stone Edge, winning the hardest battle of the run by far. And just like that, it's done. This was a long one. I got through the first four gyms in one sitting, so I expected this run to breeze by, but the fighting gym really killed my momentum, so this ended up taking almost a week to finish playing. Still less time than the Dragonite run, which took over a month, but longer than I'd initially expected. I'm sure you're all chomping at the bit to hear my opinions on the game, seeing as I've never played it before, and I have to say that I really enjoyed it. The pacing felt a bit off at times, the Team Rocket plot especially felt very backloaded. We see them at that slowpoke well before the second gym, and don't encounter them again until the seventh gym. 
The levels of Wild's Pokemon and trainers were also pretty inconsistent, with trainers sometimes being 10 levels lower than local gym leaders, and Wild's Pokemon being even weaker. But that also feels true of most Pokemon games, so I don't know how valid that criticism may seem to some of you. I also think that I'd have a more positive experience playing through this game normally and getting to explore it more. In a way, the nature of the challenge left me playing a fraction of the game since my focus was just on going from gym to gym rather than taking my time to explore and build an actual team, so that may be something I do in the future. With all that said though, I'm more than ready to wrap things up here. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. I'll be doing Hoenn next. That region is fun because it has two pseudo-legendaries instead of one. Even better, one of them is actually one of my favorite Pokemon. I've decided that I'll play through Emerald instead of the remakes, since I know that game like the back of my hand and I already have everything I need for it. I spent the first day I was supposed to be recording this run trying to get everything set up properly, and I'm not sure I can go through that again so soon. As always, please feel free to leave a comment on the video. Your interaction not only helps the channel reach new viewers, but feedback will help me know what people want to see and how I can improve. Thank you so much for watching.